pleasure, such a privilege to be asked to welcome you all here on this rather cold and inhospitable night to come and hear our esteemed guest and a warm welcome to Dr. Umesh Patel, MBE. Dr. Patel graduated from the University of Sunderland in 1978, and I believe I met another one of your compatriots um, in the Kanani family. Yeah. You do tell me there are some you know, active WhatsApp groups still going on, exactly. which I was really intrigued by. But since then, you've worked tirelessly um, to provide services to healthcare in Sunderland, and I know that you're highly respected in the community. I look forward to hearing the lecture and I'm really interested to hear about your career trajectory and I know everyone here is here to give you a warm welcome so I can give you Dr. Umash Patel. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a privilege to be here. 43 years ago I was sitting in the corner on the left hand side when my, after my final exams and it was mandatory for us to go to social gatherings. If we didn't go there, then we were, yeah, we were told that we won't get our certificate. So we all <laughs> went to, I remember going to Farn Island, and it was our very good uh, friend and lecturer, the uh, late uh, John Smith, was there and guided us. Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, he passed away two weeks ago, and I went to his funeral. Before I start the proceedings of the lecture, I would all like to say um, a, a happy birthday, sing happy birthday to my lecturer who is sitting here, Dr. Skelton. Happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he is 90 today. This is the 58th memory lecture, and I'm privileged to be here addressing every one of you. Hope Winch was the founder of School of Pharmacy here. Unfortunately, she died in an expedition in Lake District, and in her honor, we have this um, lecture every year. Paul Carter, next to her, is uh, here, and he is the chairperson of Hope Winch and he's, he's doing an excellent for, uh, work for all of us. My journey, how did it begin? That's on the left hand side, on the other side is Lake Victoria. This is River Nile. And uh, the journey of that river is 4,100 miles in Africa. It's the longest river. And that you, and if you see, if you see that part, that's where John Henning Spade discovered the source of Nile in 1862. And uh, I was privileged and, uh, to be born in the town called Jinja, and my journey started from there. In 1954, this dam was inaugurated by Her Late Majesty Queen Elizabeth, and that was a hydroelectric dam that provided uh, electricity to Uganda and the neighboring countries. Unfortunately, it is uh, redundant now because they have found some cracks in the dam. But uh, yeah, journey, and that water you see in there, you could drink it. They didn't, there was no bottled water or anything. You can still go and have a sip of water then nothing will happen to your stomach. This was that how clean that water is. The, the dam actually submerged the dam where the birds are sitting. And many years ago, that, that tree, there was a guy in, uh, around 1954, he was trapped fishing, and there were, uh, there were flying planes over him, and um, they used to throw pieces of bread, and eventually they, they rescued, rescued him. Education. My father's wish was that I study pharmacy in England. Higher education in India, I went there for two years, uh, but came to England due to ill health. Every parent in East Africa wanted their child to be uh, educated either in England for science or accountancy. Why accountancy? 
because uh, the, at, at that time, the articles you need for a year, a couple of years, is to give you 50 pounds uh, a, a, a month, and that was sufficient enough for the up, upkeep and living. Apart from that, some people went to Germany. And why? Because they, they used to do mechanical engineering or in motor industries. So there, there are three options. Either you came to England to do science, accountancy, or you went to Germany. I wasted two years in India, and when I came back, my education was, wasn't recognized. I made various attempts on A-levels. Number one, I sat for the exams, and I got IFA, all F. Second attempt, 1D and 2F. Third attempt, I got 2D and F in physics, and that physics was the hardest subject for me. Eventually, I got um, three Ds, and I got a place in pharmacy here in 1974. In 1974, I came here because I wanted to make sure that after having so many failures, my education wasn't lost. So I came here, and uh, I came to the Galen building, and there I, uh, I gave my papers. On, uh, I always had the habit of keeping my papers uh, in, as photocopies so that in case something was lost, then at least there was some proof. Jim Huss, Dr. Jim Huss, late Dr. Jim Huss, who was a <coughs> chemistry lecturer, took me around the, the Galen building chemistry labs and showed me what the course was. And he, he told me that it isn't easy for you to the course, pharmacy is a hard course. In the, at that time, it was three years, and now I, don't, I think it's four years. <coughs> in September, we were uh, standing in a queue around the huts, prefabricated huts behind Edinburgh building. And when my turn came, they told me, I'm sorry, but your name is not here, and you are not going to be admitted for the course. So I said uh, the admi to the admission officer, he said, what do I do? He said, you have to go and see Mr. Oliver, you'll see in a minute uh, where, where he was. So he was standing on the window, and I said to Mr. Oliver, knock at the door, and I said, um, he said, come in. Um, I said, uh, I've been told there's no place for you. And he says, you, you are right, there isn't any place for you. And unfortunately, we can't take you this year. We had a hard time, expel, uh, by idiom, expel lots of Asians from there. Money wasn't good. Hard to get. Now, if you see that window here, he was standing, looking outside. That was the entrance. So I went there. He was saying, turn it, turn around. That's Fred Oliver. And that's Mr. Late Vickers. And that's Dr. Late Dr. Hurst, who showed me around the building. That's Mr. Hay. He was in charge of the halls of residence over here. So we used to live in there. And you can see the current building, which is the Edinburgh building. Here on the top, there was a lecture theatre called L132. So, Mr. Oliver, I said to him, uh, Sir, I have a, 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 what, what are we going to do? He says, I'm sorry, but we haven't got a place for you. And he says to me, in that case, I'll give you a place. And, uh, and that was a turning point in my career, because he gave me a place in pharmacy when the course was absolutely full. So I did my pre-registration training under, under Mr. George Mendham, 1978-79. That was in Boots in Granger Street. In, during the war, that uh, shop was 24 hours. All the time, it was up, uh, there was no closure at all. And, and the shop was open um, for people to be served. I did 12 months as a relief pharmacist for the company. In 1979, relocated to London and worked as a local. And at that time, the fees was seven pounds an hour. Uh, I met my wife, Damini, also a pharmacy, married in, in 1981. Local work in the city of London, acquired my first pharmacy in 63 Watling Street in London, EC1 in 1980. And that's this pharmacy here. It is, it's, it's a cafe now. And the second pharmacy I took was this accountancy shop now, 
and I acquired that a year, a year later. So my wife, Dominique, was, was working here, and I was working there. And I used to, I used to have bags of goods uh, in, in my journey of pharmacy from one shop to the other, carrying toiletries and all sorts of things, go, going through Barbican, Barbican, and used to go to White Cross Street. And uh, it, was, it was very difficult because um, <laughs> Watling Street the shop, I bought it for 38,000 pounds. Why, um, and no, 24 or 28. White Cross Street branch, I bought it for 38. And uh, we were told the takings were 600 pounds a day. And the first day we went, the takings were 60 pounds. So we, that set, set us back two or three years. So eventually, sorry. So it was difficult working to pharmacies. Uh, what, I mean, you ran White Cross Street. We used to take my daughter uh, in a cot in the morning, 6.30, we used to leave home in Gosford, which was about 40 miles every day. We used to work in the shop, and then uh, in the evening, we used to take, take, take her home with us. In that time, there was an opportunity for me to buy a car, because in the paper it said 0% finance, didn't have any money. So I said to my wife, uh, look, I'm going to Sunland to buy a car, and uh, it is 0% finance because there is no money. So I came here, and the dealer in South Shields paid 20 pounds for me to come all the way by train to buy the car. <laughs> so I bought, a, I bought a Renault car, and then at that time there was some partnership problem. I don't want to name them here, but uh, they said, look, we are trying to sell this shop in uh, in Tunstall Road, and uh, we, we, we'll be quite happy to sell you the business, provided you give the money. I said, that's fine. So it was to convince Damini that, look, we need to, we, we need to go to uh, Sunderland because the cost of living is less than what you, you, you have it in London. So why, uh, this is an opportunity for us to go and move, move to Sunderland. So we came to... Um, Sunlin in 1988 established Tunstall Road shop where Damini and I both worked. Before that, I had to sell my Tunstall shop. So the Tunstall shop, there was a guy, I said to him, there are two shops I have, pick your choice, exactly the same. 38,000 for uh, 63 Watling Street, or you pay me 38,000 for White Cross Street branch and you can take pay again. So I had to engage uh, an agent. So he put it in the market, nothing, in ha nothing happened for, for the shop in, uh, uh, in Watling Street. And I was getting worried that, look, I've got this shop. Uh, we want to move away from here. What are we going to do? And uh, all of a sudden, two Italians come in, knocked at the door and said, we want to buy your shop. He said, have you got open lease? I said, uh, yes, you can do anything. You can have a cafe, a restaurant, take away, whatever you want. He said, we'll give you 38,000. But I said, look, in honesty, you have to go to my agent. Through the agent, I'll send it to you. So I said, look, please keep me out of this. And that was, would be a dirty trick for them, for me to gazam and sell them the business. So the agent said, he went to the agent, the agent says 38,000 is no good, Mr. Patel. Need more money. He right. said, We'll give you 60. He says, No, 60, no good. Then he went to 100. 100,000. He said, No, he's in Italy, he's in a special meeting, and uh, he, I need to literally have to have a higher offer before I can convince him that we'll, we'll sell you the business. And they offered me 150,000 pounds. <laughs> so I, I, I took that 150,000. Damini was still, sold that business. Damini was in White Cross Seed Branch. And the guy uh, say, says, I want to buy this business. He was a news agent. I said, are you sure? You are not experienced here. You are going to buy this. It's going to be a tough journey for you. I have already had a tough journey up to now. He said, no, no, I'm going to buy that. So he agreed. He bought it 38. And then all of a sudden, he pulled out. He said, I want to pull out. I said, why do you want to pull out? He said, I can't afford the stock we have got. I said, what do you mean? He said, 38,000 pound stock. I can't take from you. I said, well, so I phoned my dad. He was alive and I said, Dad, I have to come back from Sunday. He says, why? 
which is 38,000 pounds you want. He said, just imagine that you haven't earned any money for two years. Give the stock to him. So I was uh, on my way back, stretching my head. I said, what the hell? I'm not going to give him the stock for 38. <laughs> so I bought the whole lot in Sunland and sold them at half price. <laughs> so that was the story there. And um, we moved over here. My achievements. Uh, I joined the Sunland LPC. It was a privilege for me to chair that. Then uh, one of my very close colleague who, who is not with us, uh, Neil Chapman, um, was NPA member and he, he quit after th his three-year term and he says, Umesh, do you want to join NPA? There's an opportunity for you. And I said to Neil, I said, Neil, could I do it? He said, yeah, go for it. So I went to NPA bigger. There, I, I, I was given, uh, I, I was given uh, the, the, the chairmanship of NPA. From the NPA, I went to PSNC, Pharmaceutical Services Negotiating Committee, for people who don't know, that negotiates our remuneration with the government. Then I was chairman of local branch of Royal Farms Society, and you can see, you can see that, sorry, you can see the chain of office. And I phoned David Carter, David Carter is here, I said, David, I want this chain for the lecture. He says, I don't know where it is. I said, David, you have to find it. I want to show to the people what the chain was. So he gave me a couple of names. I couldn't track it. This was only last month. Eventually, I found it in Scotland. And it was delivered by special delivery. And that chain of office is here with me today. And late John Smith said, that chain of office probably worth more than 3,000 pounds because it's gold. And we found that chain. And uh, later on, I'm going to present that chain to Paul, because this chain, I think David and I will be with, and David said that it would be appropriate when, if John was alive, he probably wanted to, to give that chain to the university. So this will be in the exhibition here in the university, which will, which will be there for, for years to come for people to see who are the chairman and who. Um, people like even Bill Darling had put this chain on. And this it is so valuable. It is not the materialistic value. It's how people have used this chain, carried the flag for the General Pharmaceutical Council now, which was the Royal Pharmaceutical Society at that time. So they, they carried that. And so, the, yes, this is for the university. Then, from then on, I became the chairman of Royal Pharmaceutical Society for the regional branch, which I took over from, from John Smith. <coughs> Wonderful man. He died about three weeks ago, uh, not going too much into detail. His son walked in the shop and he, he said, he's almost there. And I was standing there and I took him on the side where he did the vaccination and he hugged me and he cried. I said, what's wrong? He says, my dad thought a lot about you, unfortunately he died because he had COVID. When he went home, he fell down. <coughs> and when he fell down, they took him in the hospital and he had terminal illness, and we lost him. Wonderful man. He, a lot of people have been taught by him, and we lost him. I was privileged to be Board of Governor of, Governor of University of Sunderland for nine years, and I, after nine years, my, my, one of my best friends, Mark Burton, is the current Board of Governor uh, who has taken over. Uh, I chair Sunderland NSPC, Sunderland Business Group, one year, just before COVID, we raised 27,000 pounds for the year. And that money was in my journey, I always remember, that was only to be used for Sunland, nowhere else. Uh, I chaired the Governance Committee of NPA, changed the articles, changed the constitution of the, of the association, and I also became the chairman of NPA. I was privileged, extremely privileged. One day I was... I had dropped somebody at the airport and a test was round about. I was uh, driving and I came home and I got clicked by the camera. <laughs> so I come home, I said to Dami, it's a bad day for me. She says, what's wrong? I said, I've been, I've been clicked by the camera. Then he opened the letter. He says, I said, this is a letter for you from the university. I said, keep it on one side. 
this letter must be for me to go and attend the degree ceremony. He said, you haven't even looked at it properly. And I looked at it, and it was, it was the, uh, the letter to say that they invited me to take the honorary doctorate. And uh, that was that was high lot of that. Then, after that, Damini, two NPA went to Buckingham Palace garden party. Uh, in the garden party, um, I said, uh, when it was over, uh, Prince Charles, now our king, by the chain, he said, are you a mayor of some sort? I should know, sir, I'm chairman of my association. That's why I'm, I've got a chain of office. So he, um, that was that, and we were coming down, so who knows, there's a red, red carpet, two side, side steps, and we were coming down, I grabbed her hand. I said, Damini, you're not going to go on the side test, you're going to come to the middle one. And she said, why? I said, this is where the president, Prime Minister Gandhi, everybody has walked up and down. <laughs> and two years later, I was invited for to take the MBE from Her Majesty. And that was the most uh, privileged thing I've ever had in my life. And there she is. And the thing that meant me a lot was he said to me, the country is very proud of you. That meant a lot. That's my son, Lokesh, who was very well trained by Anita and Mark Burden as a pre-registration pre student. He's got a business in London now. And that's my daughter, Tripura. He's, he's coming over for Christmas. She's, she's now in, uh, in, in Dubai. That is uh, Nigel Sherlock. He, in 2015, he made me Deputy Lord Lieutenant. And that was the privilege. The same year, Sue became uh, DL. And later on, she became the Lord Lieutenant of Tiny and Weir. Right. This is the most difficult part to tell you. Um, I had a meningitis in 2021. The photograph below, here, that happened to what happened to me. I had bacterial meningitis and hardly, hardly anybody lives in this. You're gone. You're absolutely finished. So that was me before. How I looked and see how I looked over there. Um, I was hospitalized for three months. And uh, one guy, and then I was taken to a ward. It's, a, it's quite an emotion to tell you, but she used to come at uh, about, because the visit, visiting times were between six and seven. And uh, she used to finish work at six o'clock. And, and one day I saw her and a couple of drops of uh, tears from her eyes and I called her back. And I was, I was lying like this, I couldn't get her. I was being fed like that. And uh, then she, I said, Why, what's wrong? He says, I want to come and see you. Unfortunately, I'm not able to come and see you because they, they, it, they're asking me to keep the shop open till six. And I said, what's wrong? She said, they, they say that you have to apply, it takes three months to get a grant permission. I said, shut the damn thing. I said, you can come and see me anytime. I said, you, if you want to come and see me, you can. But they were vetting because at that time, COVID was very high and they would not allow people to come in. So my daughter used to plan everything. And after I was, uh, uh, when I recovered in October, 2022, I, I went to ICC unit. And they all came rushing, and including the surgeon. And she said, I'm surprised you're standing over here. And they, they showed me one of the units. He said, number one is occupied, but you can't take any photographs. He said, that's where you were wired up with uh, kidney. Your kidneys were failing, everything was. So Mark Burden came to see me. Some of my friends came and saw me. And they used to come and visit me in the hospital. And at, at that time, it was really tough, really tough. And I used to pray to God, please don't give anything what you have given me. They never found out what was the cause of my meningitis, but it, was, it is one of the deadliest diseases you can ever get, and I got it. And uh, the surgeon told my wife, Damini, that he's got a very strong personality. He'll come out of it. I'm surprised he's come out of it. <laughs> and I did. So I was, taken, I was taken in one of the wards, uh, recovery, uh, physio ward. No, it was E52. And there's a guy called Dave, I forget his name, top physiotherapist of Sunderland Hospital. And he comes to me and he says, can I shake your hand? I said, no, no. he said, 
I see your name somewhere. I said, that, well, I don't even know. I said, I have half, I'm like half daughter here. I don't even know where I am. He said, I'm going to Google your name. Next day he comes to me, he said, can I shake your hand? I said, what for? He said, you are the one who gave me a degree on the podium. <laughs> and Steve Clam was away on covering the games. I was a, a, a privileged to be hosting the, uh, the, the degree ceremony and I, I gave the degree. And after that, things happened. Um, people came in. Um, Mark, people like Mark used to tell uh, Damini, look, anytime you want to, any cover you want, you tell me, we'll come and help you. And, uh, yeah, and, and it, it recovered. Then in the 2022, um, about 200 pharmacies were invited to go to St. James' Palace. Then it was Prince Charles. And you can see, I'm, I'm still thin there. And he says to me, um, I said, look, sir, they really looked after me when I was not well. And what, he said, what do you mean by that? I said, the NHS. Without NHS, I wouldn't have been alive. And um, he came back again to me, and he shook my hand. He says, uh, are you all right now? I said, yeah. They gave me a chair to sit down because I wasn't, didn't have the energy because I'd lost 16 kilograms in weight in my illness. And he came and saw my bad Patel. He said, ah, you must be all the Patels. You must be your consultant. You must have looked after you in your life. <laughs> <laughs> and then he became the king of England. So we are privileged that, that he was there. <coughs> what have I seen in 43 years? Pharmacy voice came in, United Voice for everyone, but that there was fragmentation and people used to fight with each other, so it didn't work out. Harold Shipman was a turning point in community pharmacies. Nobody still knows how many people he has murdered. His only war accounted is there. After that, strict regulations, accountability on drugs came in, fitness to practice. You know, you got to be fit to be there, you have to declare everything. Have you got any um, uh, convictions? You have to declare, and they will assess you on that one. The process of applying for pharmacy took longer time, more than three months, I think, maybe, maybe even six months. Pharmacy course is uh, changed from three to four years. Pre-reg exams were implemented, and there was a huge shortage of drugs. Brexit and impact on supply of chain, chain of medicines, Brexit affected, there's still shortage of a lot of medicines, and I think a lot of people are struggling to get some medicines. Pharmaceutical course is more clinical than practical experience now. You've got a lot of prescribing pharmacies. Standard operating procedures came in to see what you're doing, how do you, they can come and check. And GDPR, which everybody knows, you cannot release data to any, and pharmacy uh, quality scheme came in where you had to do lo lots of things and digitalization. The two people I'm uh, very grateful for is Elena and uh, Joe, they are here, and uh, they helped me uh, to gather all the information on. And uh, when I went to one of the, uh, the rooms in the offices, I was surprised to see so many computer screens, but in my days, those days, they weren't there, but the university has changed quite a lot. There are more pharmacies working GP surgeries, there is massive drop in drug margin. The big companies are closing. You see lots of companies are closing. Why? Because there is no margin. They used to rely on the money that was coming on drug margins and they, and they, and, 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 and they started closing the shops. So you find that also dropped the goodwill. So if you want to buy a shop, they, they were being sold at a very cheap price. Shortage of manpower because a lot of people went in surgeries. People are not getting enough money. Huge lack of funding from government. We were given, I think it was, Mark, is it 2.32 or 2.5 billion pounds? And that was fixed package for five years, and there was no uplift. They did promise that we will get more money, but that made journey for everybody very difficult. COVID outbreak, the worst thing ever we, we ever had. I went to this place in the Northeast, in a warehouse, and I saw two jumbo jets, like a, a room, back to back, two jumbo jets full of PPE, all out of date. They have a problem disposing that, and I said, can I take some photographs? They said, no, you can't. And, uh, and, the, and then he said, you know, if you didn't have the PPE, and it was a really bad outbreak like Baltimore, 
then we would have been in trouble. So basically, they had to they, they had to dump that. COVID affected a lot of people. I think we lost family members. It's a lot of sad things. I know there is a COVID inquiry now, but I think the the, the country did quite well in in the circumstances. I, I did been bad, then they would have been blamed, the government would have been blamed. So I, I sympathize with all people on the gallows at the moment, but that's the way it is, I think. The government is asking to do more for less money, no matter what you do, how much you work. Hobbin spoke that centralized dispensing is coming, and uh, they will start the internet pharmacies. Electronic transfer prescription years ago, people used to pay a lot of money uh, having pharmacy in the health centers, but the, suddenly your prescriptions are going locally now. So health centers started going down. People, uh, uh, un unfortunately, people are not surviving in the health centers, and the people have paid a lot, lot, lot of money. Um, internet pharmacies are tripping uh, in. Uh, collection, delivery of dispensed medicines, that is norm. Consolidation and, uh, of pharmacies, why? As I, I just explained to you, is because uh, uh, the margin is not there, it's hard. Health center pharmacies are, are uh, shutting down. What's the feature of this profession? There is challenges for community pharmacy, there are challenges from internet pharmacies. We have to really, really work hard. I spend, not that I do a lot of work, from 9 to 6, Monday to Saturday, where my mind, that many does the dispensing. There is huge financial squeeze, huge financial squeeze. People are having cash flow problem. Even the wholesalers are having problem, and they can't get the good because they want money first from you. And the biggest killer is the cash flow. No matter how profitable your business is, if you cannot sustain the cash flow, you are in trouble, real trouble. Paying, for, uh, paying it forwards, huh. supported, I, I supported my lecturers in, a, in their old age, uh, um, and I, I still value them. One of the classic examples is here, sitting in front, who taught me so many years ago, and he has taken this trouble to come. That's a big, big plus for me. What has this country done? It is integrated people. No matter what color you are, brown, black, white, whatever, what nationality, the biggest thing this country is of integration. Opportunities, doesn't be, there is no barrier for you in this country if you work hard. It gives you opportunities to do whatever you want. You can see from the example, it's hard work, but the country gives you opportunities. It gives you security, right? You are in safe hands in this country. NHS, no matter what people say, Slag on NHS, they made me live. That is a classic example how NHS in this country. It is the only country, it is the first biggest industry is NHS in the world, and the second biggest is the Indian Railways, right? And NHS is looking after people, we are moaning, we are not getting this, we are not getting that. But it is the NHS that looks after you. Do you tell me any country is going to give you free medicine? People are so spoiled here. But we just, they go to a doctor, I have a headache. Now, I give, give you an example. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, he, he was a GP in Leicester, and, and um, a patient walks in, some Indian guy walks in, and he, my friend is Indian as well. And he says, uh, Doctor, I've come to see, when are you coming home for my dinner? For, for dinner, he said, the doctor says, I haven't got time to, to invite, I'm here to look after the patient. He said, all right, then, uh, if you think I've wasted my time, give me a couple of hundred of paracetamol, that'll be, that for, that'll be fine for me. So there are people who, who, have, who, who have abused the system. Excellent education. You can see it from the overseas oh, students who are coming here. The opportunities you get, education you get. My father had a wish. People have wished their wish to come f to send people to England for education. And it is giving the finest education. This is the finest university, I think. And I'm proud. I'm not say saying that because I'm standing here, but it has given me a lot of opportunities and given me proper foundation. When I, uh, in, uh, when I was buying my business for my son, it was with blessings of Mark and Anita, who trained him. And uh, a friend of mine was, selling the business, 
and I'm, I'm no prime though, I'm not going to hide from you. And uh, the asking price was 1.75 million pounds. So I was in a wedding, somebody's wedding, and my friend said, you've done NPA, you've done this, you've done that. What have you done for your family? And I said, uh, it's a tough journey, you know, it's not easy. You know, farmers, it's not easy. He said, have you ever thought of your son? How are you going to work? I said, look, he's fine. He said, no, you got to get him some, uh, you, you must get him some sort of business. So we found this business. The couple actually studied here. Both had nervous breakdown, but both, they both passed the exam. And I said to him, give, I, he says, what can you do? I said, look, can you help? I said, I, I don't want you to, for a, a cheap price, but I'll give you more than the market price. And uh, the asking price went to 2.3 million pounds. And uh, no bank would lend the money. So I went to a bank here and uh, COVID hit. And he says, I'm sorry, but the whole uh, lending will have to go to London. So I have to start everything again. I have to go to London. I was, I was short of uh, 265,000 pounds. And that was money required. You know, I wasn't going to get a business for Lokesh. So I, uh, a friend of mine is not here. He was supposed to be here today. And I asked him, I said, I need some money. Um, the bank won't give me money because 90% loan was there. The balance of 265 was wanted. And he says, I'll give you the money. And I said, what security do you want? He says, you are my brother. I will never ask for any security from you. And he gave me 265,000 cash to put it in the business for locusts to buy the business. And I think the excellent training uh, Mark and Anita, Anita gave him, uh, gave him the proper foundation, and uh, he has got a good and a very su successful business. And, uh, and I said to him, one of the criteria for the bank funding was I had to put my house in, it was 500,000 pounds. The banks normally don't take any money from you, because if you're, if you're living your accommodation, they won't. And in this case, they took. And I said to my son, when I qualified in Granger Street, it was Mr. Mandem. And the day I qualified, he said, Umesh, you are carrying a bucket of water on, over your head. You spill that water <coughs> on the floor, you will never be able to pick that water. So remember that in your life, you have to be whiter than white. That's the thing you have to learn from me. So sadly, he passed. And I told my son the same. I said, you spill that water, <laughs> your dad and mom are going to be homeless because the bank has got half a million pounds mortgage on my house. But now he's happy. Um, <laughs> he's happy. He's doing well. Uh, he always uh, keeps in touch with his uh, Mark shop. He always goes there and sees them. And, and they, they loved him to bits. Uh, and that's what it is. What is else this country gave us? The country gave us Balti. They gave, us chick they gave us chicken tikka masala. <laughs> That's the thing they got, we got in this country. And if you go, if you want, any, uh, if you want um, anything like that, it is this country that gives you that opportunity. In my journey in pharmacy, success is a vehicle which moves on a wheel, named hard work, but journey is impossible with the fuel named self-confidence. Thank you very much.
cost of living. <laughs> Number one, the people, the faction of people, I think. Yeah. And uh, I somehow had this attachment of this establishment, fine university, and I could never lose the connection. I always wanted to come back. It was difficult to convince uh, Dami to come because my parents said, oh, why do you want to go back here? I said, look, Dad, whether you buy a business there or the, in, in Sunday, I think it's a better opportunity for us to settle down. And I asked some of my friends, and they said, they told me, go there. You will make some sort of feature in your career. Without Sunday, I wouldn't have been able to go to the Queen. Without Sunday, I wouldn't have been able to go to see uh, the Queen or, or the, the MBE or the local um, uh, things I got, the uh, LPC chair and love and affection from all the people sitting here. Some of them I know for years. I wouldn't have been able to get it. No. So yes, Sunday is easy place for me. That was great, really good. Um, you, men you mentioned, um, you know, you've, you painted a little bit of a bleak picture of community pharmacy there, talking about lack of funding and lack of staffing. My question is, is but you know, in your experience, which is um, you know substantial, is it cyclic? Have you been here before? In 1980, yes, when they wanted to consolidate pharmacies, I remember Watling Street was one of the licenses I gave up. They gave me 16,000 pounds just to close because they wanted to close the shops. But I think the market is driven at the moment. Market, there's no margin. It's hard work. It's difficult to convince a lot of people sitting here to say how tough it is in pharmacy. Expectation is very high. But I think the cycle will change. It will take time. I think. It's going to be tough. I would love to retire. Time. Commitments that are there. You have a, a borrowings. If I, if I come out now, I have to think about it. Half a million I've given guaranteed to my son. The bank will say, hang on, you saw the business is that. So I think it is not as bad. I think you people will have to wait a couple of years. I can start picking up, you know. But don't forget, your debtor is NHS. Yeah? They give you the money. You're not borrowed money from them. So your business is secure, but as long as you can sustain, you do the cash flow. You know, sometimes I ask, Mark, I want this, I want, can I borrow this item? I can't get it, so I, I go to his shop and get things from him. I go travel all the way uh, to, 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 to his shops and get the things. And so helping hand is there. I got Titi sitting here somewhere. She's a community pharmacy. She's got all internet pharmacies and She's my master for, for, for my IT uh, problem. She helps me in every way. I've got problems. You know, at the moment, we are giving COVID vaccine. So now they have realized what is the value community pharmacists are giving to the rest of the NHS. We are actually a backbone for them. We, we, they cannot survive without us. So I think the future is not bleak. It's bright, but you wait for it and you get it. Don't ask me any question on money. <laughs> <laughs> Umesh, thank you very much. Colin Ranshaw, class of 74. I graduated the year you started. And I think that you were very fortunate to find Sunderland. <laughs> and pharmacy was very fortunate to have you. But I look back and reflect upon what we've been doing in that period. And you talk about 74, we were a supply function veggies pharmacy, whether it was in the acute sector or community. We're moving on to more clinically orientated services sure. now. But I look back and I think, I wish I was starting pharmacy in Sunderland today. Pharmacogenomics is developing so rapidly. Do you have still that? hunger to come back and start again. <laughs> <laughs> no, I got, a, I got a reverse gear. <laughs> ah, I don't think I could pass any of the exams. <laughs> Dr. Skelton is here and he was with 
Dr. Edwards doing our chemistry labs. And uh, we, they used to mark our books, and if there was big lines across, <laughs> but I think they, they were the, uh, the true uh, the teachers. And I think we, this, is, this establishment has always, I and mean, it always gives the best lectures in the world. I, I don't care what the London University says, I don't care what they say, but here is a clever lecture. That's what it is, this, this uh, university. Lots of opportunities for people, and I say, I say it like a parrot. This country has got, doesn't matter what, what color you are, you are power, you will get whatever you want. But if you just lay back and say you expect things for free enough, no, that's not, a, that's not for you. I think there was someone else in fact. Yeah, I, I was just reflecting as a, as a local farm, a retired local pharmacist, I was privileged to work for a lot of independent pharmacies. And my feeling is, never having owned one myself, that all legislation now is geared towards the multiples, not to the private pharmacist. Do you, do you agree with that? And do you find that tough? It's changed. The, the coin is flipped now. Mm -hmm. It's not as, as, as you think it is. It is, I think more, it, the, the, the coin is double-sided in favour of us, community oh, pharmacy, more than the multiples. Mm -hmm. Multiples are in a mess. I'm, I, I, I don't have any crimes about it. I sat with them. There was uh, the one time it was all one organisation. But things are really bad in the other, on the other side. So they are, that's why they are selling. Why do you think Lloyd's pharmacy are closed so many? Yeah. They can't afford. You know, I had I sold my Southwick license to Lloyd's Pharmacy in in, in uh, Bunny Hill. I sold my uh, my pharmacy in the health centre to Lloyd's. Doctor, when I sitting here, he will tell you how bad it was. You know, the doctors used to come to me and say, you know, this place they are in a mess. Said, what do you mean? He says we are writing drugs. They are not supposed to dispense. They are still giving out because that drug was that margin was they were getting it. But nobody was there to check. If you want to have your, if you are there in your business, then you're going to look after your business, you know, everything, every penny you're going to save wherever you can. But if you rely on somebody, just, there, there is a whole group of 34 pharmacies. There's a final bid tomorrow. Which was good? It's gone. It's going. And I'm only surprised they go because mismanagement. People haven't, the staff haven't been trained, the staff are not looking forward. And there's no proper, you need to literally be focusing on your business, but that you're, you're, it's doomed, you're finished. And that's what happened in most of them. Margin was one of the things that I would say. Drug margin was hard, and that's really pulled people down. And Brexit has given a lot of shortages. It's, we are tired of telling people, please come back, please come back. The younger drug. My, my son says to me, he says, Dad, he says, he says to Domini, you know, Mom, they're really horrible people. And then she says, why? And he says, because they said, oh, you haven't got this and you haven't got that. But they don't understand the background, what's going on behind. And they, they just blame you that there is a drug shortage. It's really hard. Expectation is that you've got to meet that. If you don't meet that, then you're finished. I think then people start drifting away from you, drifting away from you. Can I just add to that, Uwe? Because I sit on the local authority health and wellbeing board at the moment. And the councillors there bringing complaints to our health and wellbeing board in the same way, blaming pharmacies for medicine shortages. And I'm trying to defend the pharmacies by explaining to them what a pharmacy and the pharmacist really is and how they are not responsible for manufacturing issues and shortages of medicines. And to me, that means we are not, as pharmacists, as professionals, getting our message across, not only to the public, <coughs> but to the councillors at our local authorities who are responsible for assessing and doing the pharmaceutical services need um, uh, uh, contracts. We're just not getting out there and getting the message across. Now, I'm sure you here in Southern, with your involvement, you are one of the few people that's been pushing that message, but we're not doing it enough at local authority level. Because they're not prepared to listen, you know. If, if you look at the HRT scenario, I, I don't dispense, she does the dispensing. They give six, seven, eight months. And there is a shortage because one person is going eight months supply of drugs, or, or six months supply. You just give them one month. 
So yeah. everybody gets a share sale, yeah. and that, that's what the problem is. But the, the demand, is, you can't, you, we, we cannot blame the surgeries. Surgeries are there, they are, they are understaffed, they have their own problems. Why do you think a lot of surgeries are uh, um, they're retiring? Because there's huge, huge problem for them. I think hospital doctor at 38,000 pounds, a window cleaner gets more than a hospital doctor. That's what I saw, 38,000. Shocking, isn't it? No wonder they were going, going to strike. So somehow money has to come up somewhere. But the taxpayer is, can't get, get, take the burden for you. We, we as a profession, in, in my profession, I think, I think it is difficult. It's not going to be easy to get money the way you want it. Because they haven't got the money. They haven't got the money. So health and well-being board, the council, they don't know. They should work in front of one day spend a day in the pharmacy. Soon, when she was chairperson, she used to visit the pharmacies and sit down, and she was in the board, and she should understand what was going on, and that was a big plus, because likes of herself, if they are in the front line, they know exactly what the problem is. They can then do the policies they want and change there. So we, uh, we have to educate them. I don't know, it's difficult, very difficult, but that's the way the world is, I think. Right. It's yes, a quick thing. It's more, not a question, but more of a bit of a nostalgic um, comment. But just as I was listening and to your presentation, I realized how long we've known each other. And I'm feeling a little bit old, Umesh. But just for those of you who don't know, I had a long career in the pharmaceutical industry. And Umesh was one of the first pharmacists I met not that many years ago. But just to say, you really, you know, it's a tough industry to be in, and it really relies on working together with community pharmacists. There's a lot of the problems about stock and issues, I, I've experienced it, and I, and I understand. But I think you just, you've been a complete inspiration, and you really taught me about the art and the science of pharmacy practice, and it's a lot I've taken into when, and we've all sort of moved into the university Thank at you. the same time. And you were there when I got my PhD. You were on the governors at the time. And just as I, just sort of no experience is ever wasted. So a lot of what I learned in the pharmaceutical industry is translated into pharmacy practice research. And I can remember one of the first papers I published, you were like, I sent it to you and you're like, yeah, okay, we need to go speak to the local pharmaceutical committee. We need to be trialing this, we need to put things in place. So I guess really, it's just for me, it's just thank you. You have a complete inspiration and you really are, you, embody what's great about Sunderland. The same looks after all of them. <laughs> 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 Presented to you, and I think David, or I can say David, it was the right thing to do. And I hope it, it, it is priceless. I uh, hope it goes in somewhere in the museum and university for people to see how many people they would think. It's probably, I don't know how many years we have all, we are privileged to have this. And I think our good friend, late John Smith, would have loved to have this in the university, and that's one of the wishes I think David said to me. So, Paul. Very Thank, you very much. Thank you. I will look after it. Before. things to do um, before we kind of finish off. Um, first of all, um, 
Can I ask the SPSA to come down? We've got the President, Aoife, and the SPSA. The Hope Winch Benevolence Fund um, provides three scholarships a year um, of, of up to £1,500 to uh, current undergraduates who find themselves in financial difficulty unintentional for no, no fault of their own and so um, the, the, the fund is, is, is exists through donations and through fundraising <coughs> and I've invited the SPSA because they, um, they're going to make a presentation to the fund so. Great, so the SPSA is delighted to support this fund every year and we arrange loads of funding and activities such as quizzes and bake sales. We actually have a quiz tomorrow night, if anyone is around. Um, so yeah, we're delighted that it's heading to such a great club. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. Can you come around the site and get your hands up? One of the groups that I'm supposed to be in the college first. 450 pounds. <laughs> SBSA for that. Um, I think um, what, what, what we find is um, we, we meet, we meet I, I'm on the panel that, um, that, that looks at the applications, we meet three times a year and um, the, the, the number of applications, there's usually about what seven or eight applications per session, it's very very difficult, it's very really hard decisions to be made to who gets it, how it I'm a big softy, I would like to give everybody <laughs> But um, we can't. And so um, you know, we award fifteen hundred pounds and um, and then, then we, we get impact statements back from the students and um, you know it's really really heartwarming when you read those and you do find that the money does really make a difference. So I think we're doing a good thing, so thank you very much. And um, hopefully sometime you you can do it again. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> We rely on donations and gifts, so if you want any more information, please contact me um, or, or um, your Dan from the, um, from the development office, um, and we'll give you some more information on that. Got any notes? After more than 30 years of working at the university, um, Professor Tony Alabaster retired, and Tony's sitting there. <laughs> so, over the years, Tony's made an outstanding contribution to the to the university, particularly in the areas of health and environment. And um, in 2016, he was our dean of the Faculty of Health Science and Wellbeing. And he played a massive role in the transformation of the university to what it is now. So um, Tony's always been proud when the students graduate. And he's always been a great advocate of the Hope Winch Society. And that's what this is about. Because this is a big thank you, Tony, for supporting the Hope Winch Society. So I'm saying that on behalf of the Hope Winch Society. You've given us support, you've been generous in your time, you've um, attended events, prize givings, and even some reunions. And also you've been generous in your money as well. So he was, Tony, you know, funded many of our events and we're, and we're very grateful for that. So, um, you know, we've been able to grow and flourish because of that. And it's because you care, and I know that. He cares about, about the students, and, he, and, and he, he firmly believes that keeping in touch with 
graduates, when they get out into the world, when they, in their working lives, keeping in touch, reaps massive benefits. And um, so, so, Tony, thank you very much. And I believe we've got a little gift for you. So would you like to come down? There we are, Tony. You've given out loads of these. It's your turn now. <laughs> Thank you, folks. It's been an absolute privilege, an honour, and a pleasure, and long may it continue. Thank you. Now present Yumesh with a gift in a mantelpiece <laughs> from the Glass Centre to thank you for the talk. Now I, I agree with what people have been saying. You're an inspiration, and you, you're a great um, advocate for for Sunderland. So thanks for that. Yumesh has always kept in touch. Yumesh is one of the the biggest fans of the Hope Room Society, I think. <laughs> so, thank you. Thank you. And um, just a little present also for Damini, who <laughs> um, has supported you, Mesh, and we've heard all about you. So, we know. <laughs> I'll have to do more vaccines tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you. Right, and I think um, I think that concludes the uh, lecture for today. So thank you very much for coming on it's such a wild night, but um, and, and great, and hopefully see you again next year because remember this is an annual event, <coughs> so and it's been a brilliant turnout.